Hey, ladies and gents, we are back looking at the binomial distribution. We're going to talk about how to calculate binomial probabilities. There's actually three ways of doing that. We've looked at one of them, and that is using the formula. This one here, the probability of some value x is equal to n choose x times p to the x times 1 minus p to the n minus x. That was the formula that we used in the last video. Another one that we can use here is in Excel. And in Excel, we use the binome dist function. And so it's got as its arguments or parts of the formula x, n, p, and then a true and false, true or false. You want to take a look at the video for the lab video, the, the lab video on the binomial distribution functions. The third way to do this is to use tables. And so on the next two pages, you're going to see that there are tables. It's really important that you print out these tables and you bring them to the exam. You're also going to print out the table for the normal distribution, as well as the formula sheet. But we'll talk about that more in class. So let's get back to how do you actually use the binomial tables to calculate probabilities. First thing I want you to note is that if you take a look at this formula up here, the one that we use to calculate, whoops, the one that we use to calculate probabilities, what you'll notice here then is that there's two things that you need to do to know, and that is you need to know your n and you need to know your p. Then for any given x value, you can calculate a probability. So we call n and p the parameters of the binomial distribution. That is, these two values completely define the binomial distribution. So if you know what n and p are, then for any x, you can calculate the probability p of x. So let's take a look at how the tables work. One thing that's important to note here is that this, the tables only go up to an n of 10. When we get into bigger n's, we'll be using something called the normal approximation of the binomial. We'll learn about that at the end of the next section on normality, so unit n. But let's take a look at how this works. So calculating probabilities for an n of less than or equal to 10 and a p of less than or equal to 0.5, I want you to remember the coin experiment. In the coin experiment, we had n is equal to 10 coins and we toss those, and we recorded the, the number of heads. P is equal to 0.5, and that's equal to the probability of getting a head per coin. So for any particular coin that you toss, the probability of getting a head is 0.5. Those are the two parameters of that particular binomial distribution. N equals 10, P is equal to 0.5. So what we do then is we follow these steps right here. Look in the left-hand column to find the block of numbers corresponding to n. Then look across the top to find the p, or the nearest p. That'll determine the column to use. And then the probabilities can now be read for the specific x, starting from 0 up to n. Let's take a look at that for the coin experiment. So first thing is we look here to find the n. So you'll see that there's blocks of n's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up to 10. So this is the block that we're going to be looking at. Then we go to the top here and take a look then at the p. And in our case then the p is 0.5. So that tells us that we're going to be using these guys right here. Now those are the p of x's. The corresponding x values are these guys right here. So there you go. Now, we had calculated a couple of these guys before. Remember, we were looking for the probability that x is equal to 2, and it turned out by hand to be about 4%. And then we looked at what's the probability that x is equal to 0, and it turned out to be about 0 0.0010. So we did a couple of these by hand. But here's how you use that's how you use the table then to find the p of x's. I'm just going to go over here to an Excel spreadsheet 
And what I've done is I've actually put the two columns together. So this is a probability distribution then for a binomial problem, the coin tossing experiment. We're looking at page B8, number 8. And so here's our X column, and then here's our P of X column right here. All right, so that's what we've, we've got there. Let's just go back here and take a look at what we've just looked at, and that's this guy right here. Use the table to determine the 11 P of X's. Remember there's 11, because although N goes up to 10, it starts at zero. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 is 11 different numbers, 11 possible outcomes. So that's that one there. Now let's take a look at, at this guy right here. This is, use the table to determine the 11 P of X's for the dice rolling experiment. So in that particular one, remember, we had N is equal to 10 dice. And a success was considered to be a 1. And so that's 1, 6, if you roll a die. There's a 1, 6 chance that any particular die will have a 1. So those are the two parameters that we have. If we were to use the formula here, we would say the probability that x is equal to some number is equal to n choose x, so it would be 10 choose x times p, 1 sixth, to the x power, and then 1 minus 1 sixth, which is 5 sixth, to the n minus x power. If we were to do this using a binome dist function, we would say it's equal to binome dot dist. Oops, uh, how do you spell dist? There we go. Okay, binome dist. And then you would put in your x value, whatever that is, 0 up to 10. Your n, which is 10. And then 1 6 is your p, and then you would put in, if you want the exact probabilities, they would be false. And again, take a look at that lab video on the binome dist function, and you'll see that explained in detail there. Now, in our particular case, 1 6 is actually about 0.1666 repeated. And so if we go down here, we would find the n of 10. So we're, we're back down to this particular bottom block of numbers here. But the, the closest we have actually is, is 0.15. And uh, so if you take a look at 0.15 and 0.2, you would see that we'd be somewhere close to those, something close to the 0.15. And so that's these numbers down here. Now, those aren't going to be exactly right. We're going to go through and talk about how to do this by hand. But let me just go back here to Excel, where I've actually done that for you. And so these are the actual probabilities that we have for a P of 1 sixth. And then I've got the, the columns on either side of them that come from the table. So this is the P of 15%, and then on the other side, the P of 20%. So you can see where that's for the first one here. The 16% is between the 19% and the 10%. And of course, it's closer to the 19 or 20% there because 0.1666 is closer to 0.15 than it is to 0 0.20. So these are the exact ones that you would get by, by hand. Or if you were to do this with a binome dist function, and the closest that we can get by table is actually this column right here. All right, let's go back here then and say that what we've done is we've taken a look at this guy right here, number nine. The, the last thing here is, I just want to take a look at this up here. Let me change colors again. So calculating probabilities when n is less than or equal to 10 and p is greater than 0.5. So let me give you an example here. Suppose we were looking at an n of, uh, well, let's 
changed it to say an n of eight just because I've already messed up the the table on the on the next page there where I've got the the block of ten here. But let's take a look at an n of eight. I'm just choosing some number. And let's say we're looking at a p of let's say 0.7. It turns out that this would be exactly the same as a p of 0.3. And then if you were to take a look at, say, an x of, oh, let's say, 2, what you do is you, you take 8 minus 2, which would be 6. So that would be equivalent of a, of a p of 0.3 for an n of 6. Let me show you that by, by formula. I'll, I'll actually write it down here. So if we had an n equal to 8 and a p equal to Point seven. then what we would have here is the probability that x is equal to, uh, let's say, 2. Of course, this will be for anything up to 8. Would be equal to 8 choose 2 times 0.7 to the second power times 0.3, its complement, to the sixth power. So the two powers add up to, to 8. So 8 minus 2 is 6. And then the 0.7 and the 0.3 add up to 1. So it's 0.7, and then, which is p, and then 1 minus p, it's complement. Now, the other thing to remember here is that 8 choose 2 is 8 factorial over 2 factorial, 6 factorial. And what I'm saying here, then, is that that's exactly equivalent to an n equal 8 and a p equal to 0.3, where we're looking for the probability of x equals 8 minus 2 is 6. So that would be 8 choose 6 times 0.3 to the 6th power times its complement, 0.7, to 8 minus 6, which is the second power. And what you need to know then is that 8 choose 6 is 8 factorial over 6 factorial, 2 factorial. All right, now you can see why they're equal to each other. Because 8 choose 2, which is 8 factorial, over 2 factorial, 6 factorial, is the same as 8 choose 6, which is 8 factorial over 6 factorial, 2 factorial. And then we've got a 0.7 squared, 0.7 squared, and a 0.3 to the 6, 0.3 to the 6. So we've got actually all three parts are identical here. They're just in different orders, that, which doesn't matter with multiplication. So what does that mean practical? Practically, well, it says here when p is equal to point is greater than 0.5, you find the value for n, you find the block, and then you look across the top to find 1 minus p, the complement. And then you read actually um, going up the column instead of going down. Let me show you. In this example that we've been talking about where n is equal to 8 and p is equal to 0.7, we would be going to... Let me just change colors here. We go to the 8 block, which is right here. And then instead of going to 0.7, because remember, the highest it goes is 0.5, we take the complement of 0.7, which is 0.3. So we're going to be looking at these blocks of this block of numbers here. And then what you do is you actually count going up this way. So the 8 actually is equivalent to a 0. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So in the example that we were talking about, I was saying if you wanted to look for an n equals to 8 and a p equal to 0.7, and then what's the probability that x is equal to 2? That's equivalent to an n equal to 8, p 
P equal to its complement, which is 0.3, and X equals to 8 minus 2, which would be 6. So it would actually be then... this guy right here. So we'd be looking at right there. That's the probability right there. So that's how we calculate probabilities when we've got a p greater than 0.5. All right, let's move on to taking a look at the shapes of the binomial distribution, page B11 here. And so what we can do is we can create a histogram for any binomial distribution given its n and p. So the vertical axis is, is actually really similar then to an f over n. Remember the way that we defined a probability, an objective probability as being a, the limit of the relative frequency. And so uh, P of X then goes on the vertical axes, and then on the horizontal axes, we've got the values of X. The thing to remember about th these bars here is that they actually have no thickness. So it, it looks like they, they've got some thickness here that, you know, zero, the zero bar goes somewhere from minus 0.2 up to positive 0.3 or something like that. But, but it's actually just a single straight line going from zero up, and then one up, two up. And that's because this is a discrete distribution. The discrete meaning that it's, it's taking on countable values, in this case, integer values. So you count the number of successes. You can't have one and a half successes. You can have zero successes, or one success, or two successes, three, right? If you toss 10 coins, flip 10 coins, then you've, you get two heads, or you get three heads, or four heads. You don't get three and a half heads. So there's actually no space, there, there's no, uh, that there's complete space between the numbers here. But the important thing to note here is the shape of the distribution. So when P is less than 0.5, then what you end up is with everything kind of bunched over to the left-hand side. Think of this as when we're looking at the dice rolling experiment. In that case, then, P is equal to 0.1666, right? That's 1.6, and so that is a P less than 0.5, and so it tends to be everything is bunched up on the left-hand side. And so we would say that it's positively skewed, so it's skewed towards the right. It's like you've got a, a nice distribution here, and then you've got the right-hand tail being yanked, yanked upwards. Uh, this particular example here is for a P equal to 0 0.10. The opposite kind of thing happens when you're talking about a high P. So this is an example of P equal to 0 0.90. In this case, it's just actually the mirror of what we've got, but everything is on the right-hand side, and so you've, this is actually negatively skewed. It's like you take the left-hand side, the lower side, and you give it a, uh, a pull down to pull the mean down. This is actually the histogram for the, the coin tossing experiment here, where you've got an n equals 10, and you've got a p equal to 0.5. And so this is a symmetric distribution when p is equal to 0.5. And this is the exact distribution that we would have for the coin tossing experiment. And you can see that nice symmetry there. This last one is a really interesting one here. When n is greater than 20, actually it turns out we don't really have to worry about that part here. We're just going to be looking at if n times p is at least 5 and n times 1 minus p is at least 5. And those are things that you're just going to have to take as, as a given. There's mathematical proofs behind that, but uh, those are just numbers you just have to remember. That's it then the distribution will be actually approximately normal. So you can see this nice bell-shaped here that we have of these bars. And so 
that's going to be really important when we take a look at something called the normal approximation to the binomial. When you've got a really high n, it's really hard using a calculator or sometimes even a, a computer, depending on how big the n is, to, to use the formula with such large numbers. And it's almost impossible when you're doing this by hand to do some of the calculations. It would take you forever. But we can actually convert it into a normal distribution and do the calculations. So we're going to see that at the end of unit n. So that's going to take us to the end of this particular unit. We will call it, or this particular section, I should say. And so we're going to stop here.